Okay, Benny, next up, we're going to do the Bias Plus reports uh, for week, what are we going into, 11? In week 12. Going into week 12. All right, yes. And I have week 11 written on my paper. That's why it's throwing me off. But I got all the games. Uh, let's kick it off with uh, the first one on the schedule. Bias Plus report, NFL week 12. I got that one right. Texans at Detroit Lions. Bias plus score 1.1 favors Houston. So if you multiply that by 11, you'd be about an 11 point um, uh, uh, average on uh, um, gross numbers, but 1.1 differential there uh, between Houston. And the thing about it is I look look at this. Um, Houston has got a minus 0.4 in turnovers, and they're minus 4.5 uh, in terms of their net points. De uh, Detroit is minus 6 in terms of their net points. So both teams are in the negative, and the differential to some degree hung on the fact that uh, Detroit um, – got a little closer because they uh, did better in the turnover range, but that just tightened the score down to 1.1 favoring Houston Texans. Deshaun, he can do it by himself, can he? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, uh, last week Deshaun put in work on the once vaunted Patriots defense, completed 28 to 37 passes, 344 big yards, and three touchdowns. Went to work on them boys. Now, although the Texans only have three wins this season, Deshaun continues to ball out every week. He's put up 300 plus yards in five of his 11 starts, and he's never thrown for less than 250 yards. And he's accounted for, this is a big stat here, he's accounted for 88% of his team's total yardage this year. Take the Texans in this one. Lions don't have a chance. Don't have a chance, he says. Okay, take the Texans, he says. The Washington football team is going into Dallas. In the previous segment, I, I talked a little bit about Dallas's defense playing a little bit better. Bias plus score 6.2, however, favors Washington. Alex Smith against the Red Rifle. Um, two veterans uh, coming off of injuries. Alex Smith, you know, we know about his injury, but I don't think he was hurt last week. But, you know, we, um, what's his name? The Red Rifle. Why am I forgetting Dalton. his name? Dalton. Yes, Andy, yeah. Um, coming back. And I think that helped, that helped Dallas also. They felt like they had a competent quarterback. So, but Washington's favorite, who you have? Okay, so Washington's favored, but let me say this. And he did come back from injury, and he came back looking really good. He was really sharp. Uh, he led the Cowboys to a hard-fought 31-28 win over Minnesota, a team that I'm pretty sure was favored over them. And the way their defense was playing, uh, I didn't think that they would be able to compete with Minnesota. But, in fact, they did and won the game. Now, Andy threw three touchdown passes. Only had one interception, and he got plenty of help from Zeke Elliott, ran 21 times for 103 yards, and had a receiving touchdown. The beleaguered Dallas defense was brutalized by Dalvin Cook and Adam Thielen, which means Kirk Cousins had a good game. Excuse me. Just want to make sure you heard that. What was one of those guys' names? Dalvin Cook? Yes. Doesn't he run the ball? Yes, he does. So you're giving Kirk Cousins credit for okay. Dallas Cook's let me, let running me capability? Myself. Let me repeat myself. Perhaps you were distracted and you didn't hear me. I said <laughs> Dalvin Cook and Adam Thielen. No, I understand about the Adam Thielen. Anything with the ball. I didn't question that. I was just questioning Dalvin Cook. The ball. No, the earlier in the <clears throat> show, bro, you tried to come at Kirk Cousins low key, and I'm letting you know. You're wrong on this one. Well, so what was what was what was his percentage again? 
What? His quarterback rating? Yeah, right. I mean, no, it's percentage. Did you have his percentage there? Completion percentage? Uh, no. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. And he did lose that game, right? The game was 31 to 28. Okay. Some reason you didn't say yes or no to my question. Yes, they lost the game. The Vikings <laughs> lost the game. What is your point? I don't get it. My point is this. You made Bias plus like 6.2 favors Washington. Who you got? Oh, no, 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 no. You're not going to do me like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not going to do me like that. We ain't going to argue, Kirk Cousins. Ad Listen, infin- how say ad infinite? Is that the word? When Kirk Cousins plays poorly, I tell you, he played poorly. I let everybody know your favorite whipping boy deserves to get whipped. But when he doesn't play poorly, you can't diss him like that. That's not right. They fell behind in this game because of turnovers, I believe. And they came roaring back. And for some strange reason, I don't know if it was the smashing of watermelons or what it was, okay? But the Dallas defense woke up and they were able to hold them off. And like I said earlier, Andy Dalton was really sharp. He really looked good. So the Dallas defense overcame the Kirk Cousin-led Vikings offense. Yes, they were able to hold them back. Just the Dallas defense. Pull out the win. The Dallas the worst defense in the league. That is correct. Was able to keep. The- yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> in fact, Dalton had to pull the game out at the end. It was a minute twenty-seven left in the game before he hit his tight end. Uh, Dalton Schultz for the winning score. So this game, this was a really good game. This was a knockdown drag out, man. It was a good game, no doubt about it. I enjoyed every minute but, of it. But, but sure. Kirk Cousins did get off. Thielen was spectacular. Well, not let, just with his let's number. stop. Let's stop with the Thielen was spectacular for a minute because yeah, <clears throat> on both cases you had a receiver that made their quarterback. Look really good, cause that that one-handed catch Thielen oh, had was a thing of beauty. And no. then on the other side, you had your young boy. Was it Judy? Is it Jefferson? Jefferson. No, Jefferson. no, for the Cowboys. For the Cowboys, With the spinning backwards two-hand catch. CD Lamb. CD Lamb. Oh, that was gorgeous, man! You had two beautiful, I mean, classic receptions in that one game, bro. That's what they pay them for. So what? It was still beautiful. What do you mean? No, no, I'm not saying it wasn't beautiful. You're trying to say they were bad throws. And the receiver... No, no, I didn't necessarily say they were bad throws. You said the receiver bailed them out. Those are your words. Well, I did say that. Because it wasn't exactly the easiest of catches. Those are catches that had a high degree of difficulty. Bro, this is the NFL. That's okay, what they but it's paid for. It's still a high degree of difficulty. Not everybody makes those catches. I didn't say it wasn't. I didn't say it wasn't a high degree of difficulty. Again, That's all I'm saying. Again, you tried to slide a diss in on the quarterback. <laughs> I'm not letting you get away with that. <laughs> I'm not letting you get away we, with we, that. We can only go so far talking about Kirk Cousins. We, we need I'm to not talking forward. about Kirk Cousins because now you're cracking on Andy Dalton too. Come on, man. Get these guys to break. Both of those were high degree of difficulty catches, weren't they? Yes, they were. They were beautiful catches, weren't they? Yes, they were. Okay, so, you know, a high they, degree they, no, of difficulty means question. it wasn't. And we're asking the next question. Pass to the Did catch ratio. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. Out? Were those catches bailouts for the quarterback? I say no. I say the quarterback put the ball where he had to put it and they went and got it. And that's what they paid them for. And, and the, I say, no that, I say they were special catches from guys no, who are super talented you and you probably only catches. got a handful of guys who in the league that would make those catches. Wow. That's why they are that's who they are. Problem. Huh? I didn't say anything about the catches. Well, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the catches. Didn't say anything disparaging about the catches. Yes, they were great. Yes, they were special. 
Yes, only a handful of guys can make the kick. Yes, yes, yes. But did they bail the quarterback out? No. That's the only thing I'm disputing with. Okay. Wood. Well, we'll we'll that's agree it. to disagree. We'll we agree to disagree that, on that. Can we agree to disagree and move on? on? That's my one dispute. Next game, Ravens Steelers. Oh, oh by the way. What did you say on this one? Take the Cowboys. You're going against the bias. Absolutely. Taking the Cowboys. Absolutely. All right. Ravens at Steelers. All right. First off, um, did you see the notice that came out? They're moving this game to Sunday? Yes, sir. They're moving this game to Sunday. Ten plus Ravens <laughs> or Ravens personnel have come down with COVID. And they have shut down the facility. They have not practiced at all. So they're hoping that they can get the facility opened up uh, after they get everybody that's infected away in quarantine so they, they can get in some practice time. So they move the game to Sunday. I like that. I, I, you know, I think that this is a game that we all want to see, no doubt about it. And it'd really be nice if they had the majority of their players available to them. Uh, for this contest. Bias plus score 9.3 favors the Pittsburgh Steelers. Well, uh, there's still something wrong with Lamar Jackson. Uh, he missed badly on several throws last week uh, in an overtime loss to the Titans. And two of them were potential touchdowns and they mm. were just really poorly thrown balls. Um, he's still racking up good rushing numbers. But with Mark Ingram and J.K. Dobbins being amongst those who have come down with COVID, uh, they won't be there, which means the running game is pretty much in the hands of Gus Edwards and Jackson alone. Um, they do have another back, Justin Hill. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's not his name. His last name is Justice. I'm sorry. But he doesn't play much. He hasn't played much, and I don't expect him to play much. Um, a lot of people in fantasy are running and grabbing Gus Edwards because uh, a committee backfield has now come down to a, a one back backfield. So people are expecting him to do well, but I think they're uh, neglecting the fact that they're playing the Steelers. So I don't think he's going to get that much done on the ground. Um, whew, take the Steelers in this one. I hope it's a good game. I expect it to be a good game. I think the Ravens may be able to slow down the Steelers offense a little bit, but after seeing some of the things I've seen over the last couple of weeks, especially with uh, Derrick Henry just slowly pummeling them into submission and then in overtime just breaking away and winning the game in walk-off fashion, uh, I'm starting to doubt the Ravens a little bit. So take the Steelers. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, Steelers, uh, number four in offense, number one in defense, and number one in average turnover differential, our friend Todd. So, yeah, the, 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 um, the Ravens fall off, especially on, on offense where they're coming in 12th. So they've got some work to do. All right, next up. The Raiders at Atlanta Falcons, bias plus 3.3, favors Las Vegas Raiders. Now, again, uh, the Raiders um, wound up at a net point of one, playing Atlanta with a net point of negative 2.3. So uh, that kind of takes you to where you need to be. Neither one of these guys are, are really scaring everybody. But this could be an interesting game. The Falcons have a lot of news coming out of that organization. I think they were there was something about the general manager and uh, they, you know, the coaches. I think he wants to stay. You know, I think he's he's vying for that long term Atlanta spot. And they've been playing better. You know, um, since uh, what's his name, Alfred Morris um, became head coach. So. Uh, Raheem 3.3 Morris. favors the Raiders. Yeah, Raheem Morris was a head coach. Raheem all Morris, thank you. I don't know where I got Alfred from. He, he had a stint as a head coach with uh, Tampa Bay a few years ago, and I'm sure he'd like to be a head coach again. I think he likes where he is. I think the players like him, and they've been playing well. Uh, but uh, the high-flying Falcons offense 
was completely dismantled by the surging Saints defense. And again, this is that teams get better, teams get worse type thing. The Saints defense was looking shaky early on, and we're used to the Saints defense kind of looking shaky. I expected them to be better. They didn't start off the season the way I thought that they would, but they're starting to come on. Uh, Matt Ryan was sacked eight times. You take eight sacks, that's got to hurt. That Eight sacks, I didn't even count the hurries. There had to be a ton of them. And the hits after he threw the ball, my goodness, he's probably in a tub of ice right now still. Uh, he was intercepted twice, and uh, he got outplayed by Taysom Hill. <laughs> yeah. Why he laugh like that? <laughs> <laughs> he got outplayed by Taysom Hill because Matt Ryan is leading the league in passing yardage. Uh, the Falcons are known for their offensive prowess. Um, wide receiver for the Falcons, hamstring. Julio Jones. Julio. What Without about Julio, is, that the, is it the same offense if Julio's not right? No, it's not the same. But Julio's not Devontae Adams. Julio doesn't get the kind of targets Devontae Adams gets. Julio can't carry them. They got Calvin Ridley, who's an excellent receiver also. They have Russell Gage, who's a pretty good third guy. They have Ty Gurley, who catches the ball out of the backfield. The Saints took it to them. They took it to them. That's all is to it. They, they completely dismantled them, like I said. Now, on the other side of this, we got the Raiders. So Derek Carr comes to town after going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Patrick Mahomes for the second time. First time he beat him. This time he didn't beat him. But he did go toe to toe. The Raiders' offense is formidable, believe it or not, and their defense is not bad. I'm taking the Raiders in this one. Going with the bias, the Raiders 3.3. LA Chargers at the Bills. Bias plus score 2.6 favors the Buffalo Bills. With, um, <sighs> With the Cincinnati quarterback going down, um, sort of taking him out of that uh, rookie MVP race, um, Herbert, that arm, man, that arm that guy got has is uh, is top notch. I'm looking at you know when you're looking at the quarterback, you just talk pure arm talent. He's got that little a lot more athletic than what you think. Still really young. Um, if that defense shows up right now, man, I mean, their defense is ranked 24th. I mean, Buffalo's is not that much better. They're ranked 20th, but Buffalo's offense is ranked 11th. So um, LA Chargers, Buffalo, and you're Buffalo. You've been rooting for them all week. So who you got? Well, yeah, okay. This is um... – two of my favorite teams to watch the bills as a team and the charges because of Justin Herbert. Uh, I love watching this guy throw the ball. He's, he's, he's tremendous. And like you said, he's, he's going to move up as the front runner for offensive rookie of the year. Now that um, Joe Burrow is down, uh, he's having a spectacular rookie season torched the jets last week for a career high, 366 yards on 37 to 49 passing and he threw for three touchdowns. Uh, unfortunately, that was against the Jets. Uh, Josh Allen's been up and down for the Bills, uh, production-wise, but mostly up. And the Buffalo defense should be able to seal the deal in a potential barn burner type of game. I expect this game to have a lot of passing. I expect this game to have a lot of touchdowns and a lot of spectacular plays. But the Bills defense, like the Cowboys defense, like the Saints defense, is showing market improvement over the last few weeks, and I think that will continue. So I'm taking the Bills. All right. I'm going to have to take note of them so we can see where those guys are in the rankings defensively and watch them over the next four weeks to see which one of these guys uh, lives up to uh, that lofty 
uh, charge you just put on them there about moving up. Speaking of moving up, the New York football giants, they're getting ready to go play those Cincinnati Bengals. They've got three guys that I don't know at all potentially starting at quarterback. Bias plus score of 2.0 favors the Giants, and that does not take into account the fact that Joe Burrows is not there anymore, and that production uh, is going to be replaced by Mr. Unknown. What do you have on this? Um. <clears throat> They'll probably go with Ryan Finley unless they've got something else up their sleeves. Ryan Finley's the guy that came in for Joe Burrow once he went down. Ryan Finley probably should not be in the NFL. I don't think that Ryan Finley. Wait, wait you said he should not be in the NFL. Yeah, he should not be an NFL quarterback. I don't think he's got the goods. I really wow. don't. I just don't. But, I mean, running back Joe Mixon – uh, sustained a foot injury about four weeks ago. It's gotten worse instead of better. Um, they thought it was minor. Obviously, it's now major. He's on IR. He might be done for the season. It's it's touch and go, but it's not looking good. Um, with my man going down, Joe Burrow, and that's a bad knee injury, too. He tore his ACL and his MCL. So he's obviously gone for the season. Um, I don't know who else they have besides Ryan Finley. If you heard some other names, um, they're probably going to give Finley a chance and see what he can do against a team that they think they can compete with because it's the Giants. Um, but they should be probably shopping around for a free agent quarterback somehow, somewhere pretty soon. I'm taking the Giants. I believe the Giants will win this game. Their defense isn't great, but it gets better every week and is plenty good enough to beat Ryan Finley. Now, fantasy-wise, it's a shame because Tyler Boyd was having a solid season at receiver. T. Higgins, another rookie, has upped his game to the point where he's arguably the number one receiver on this team. A.J. Green, just back from being out all last season, started off slow. But even in the last two weeks, he's beginning to pick it up. And now this. So uh, if you got those guys on your fantasy teams, you might want to take a second look at least this week um, and, and try to put somebody else in their place because I don't think they're going to be able to produce like they've been doing. It's a shame. I'm looking at the team uh, depth chart as it stands right now. They have Ryan Finley as the second string and Brandon Allen as the first string. Brandon Allen. Brandon Allen. Let me tell you, I just took a quick look he, at Brandon Allen. He's been around. And, huh? He's been around. He played for somebody else. He, he was a backup for somebody else. There was a couple of Allens. There was Kyle Allen, who's with Washington now. And he, he backed up Teddy Bridgewater in Carolina. And Brandon Allen... I almost want to say, I don't want to guess. I don't want to guess. You got anything on his career? Well, he came out of Arkansas. I see that right now. 6'2", 209. Um, so far, 2019 season, he's got 515 yards, tied for ninth, for 91st. First. For Three who? touchdowns, two interceptions. For what team? For the Bengals. So he, he, oh, so he's been on the Bengals. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, take the Giants. Take the Giants, I know. <laughs> All of that being said, take the Giants. Please. <laughs> All right, you ready for this one? I have not I have not picked an intriguing game of the week. The Colts usually uh give me some good drama. Um, and I've been doing good with them. Tennessee Titans at the Indianapolis Colts with a 4.4 bias plus score favoring the Colts. Now, let me just say here, again, two teams, both in the positive net points, uh, Indianapolis ranking fifth and the Tennessee Titans ranking 12th. 
So the Colts have that bias plus in their favor. Um, what do you think? Well, last week, Derrick Henry pummeled the Ravens' tough run defense for 133 yards on 28 carries. He finished them off with a 29-yard touchdown run in overtime. You know, it's Just, nice. He never looks like he should be able to run away from guys, exactly. the backs and stuff, but he does it constantly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And uh, it was just two weeks ago that the Colts defeated the Titans, because this is a division game now. The Colts defeated the Titans 34-17, and they held Henry to 103 yards, held him to 103 yards on 19 carries. Okay, so he got his volume. They kept him just a little bit above 100 yards, and I do not believe he scored in that game. Key. So, exactly, that's key. So, now, with the Colts' defense thriving and the Titans' defense severely hampered with injuries and all kinds of stuff, look for Phillip Rivers to take care of business in this one. He's thrown three touchdown passes in three of his last five games. So your other whipping boys heating up a little bit. Okay. Take the Colts in this one. Should be a good game. It, Henry's going to get his volume, but the Colts come to play on defense, man. Them boys hit. They hit. They, they're not going to let him just run them over. And they're not going to be out there making business decisions like some of these other teams do when they see him coming through the hole. <laughs> this is going to be a tough one. And remember, Tannehill's been struggling. Tannehill's been struggling, so if they have trouble, he's the one that's going to have to bail them out. I don't think he can do it. Well, I hey, I can't I can't argue with any of that. And as far as my second favorite whipping boy, Philip Rivers, I got to show him a little respect. He's looking better. His uh, decision making, he's getting the ball out. And, uh, you know, he's, he's running that offense pretty efficiently. Uh, the Colts ranked 10th on offense, putting up 27.6 per game. Uh, Tennessee is actually putting up 27.9, but Tennessee's ranking 18th on defense while the Colts are ranking 5th. Ergo, Colts. Carolina Panthers at Minnesota Vikings. Bias plus score of only 0.4 favors the Panthers. Second favorite whipping boy. Who do you have on this? Or first favorite whipping boy, actually, right? <laughs> Numero uno. My man, Pots and Pans, Kirk Cousins. So let's talk about the Panthers for a second. So last week, one of our favorite players from ex, from his XFL day. <laughs> yeah, Temple alum and XFL star, P.J. Walker, got his first NFL start. He did not disappoint. He was 24 of 34, 258 yards, and he threw four touchdowns. I don't believe – oh, yeah, he did. He had two picks. He did throw two interceptions. Now, it's his first NFL start, Okay. He didn't go to LSU. He went to Temple, all right? He didn't get drafted into the NFL. He played in the XFL. So let's give him a break on that one. Um, Can I say something about those two picks? Sure. They were both red zone, end zone picks. Yes, they were. His ability to throw the deep ball looks a little bit better than what he looked in that cramped up, fast-moving red zone scenario. Um, right. He might have he might have got a contract right after the game had he not thrown those picks, <laughs> even if he got field goals, because those picks really marred a really nice uh, 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 day that he had. Um, I mean, it happens, you know. And like you said, he's coming in, you know, first game, blah blah blah. That's a tough place. Is why they call it the red zone. But man, you know, chance for greatness right there, you know. Yeah, so. that's true. But again, let's remember, no OTAs, no preseason games, no real training camp, um, you know, which means no snaps with the first team until Teddy gets hurt. So he had one week of practice with the first team. 
Maybe they didn't get enough end zone work in. You know what I mean? And, and the other thing he, is he tried to run one in. He was a little light in the butt, though. <laughs> yeah, he's a skinny kid. He, he was going, too. He was, like, right there, and he just stopped, like, bam, like he hit the yeah, wall. He, just, like, he wasn't moving nothing. <laughs> he's, a little, he's a little light in the pants. Um, <laughs> so as of now, Teddy Bridgewater is still listed as questionable. I didn't get a report on whether or not he had a limited practice or practiced at all, but he's still carrying a questionable tag. So I'm not exactly sure what his status is, but I believe I read that he would have been able to play last week if they really needed him, if it was an emergency situation. So I think that bodes well for him starting this week. I think, I think he'll be okay. Um, the so can, the, can the can the Minnesota uh, can the Carolina defense deal with that Cal, Dalvin Cook guy? That's the question. Well, the Vikings are coming off an upset loss to Dallas, but let's remember they spotted him a sixteen to seven lead at halftime, thanks to two fumbles. Um, they got it in gear in the second half. Kirk Cousins went twenty two of thirty for three hundred and fourteen yards and three TDs. Not too shabby. <laughs> and Dalvin Cook rushed for 115 yards and a touchdown. I'm going to take the Vikings in this one. I, I like the Panthers. I want the Panthers to win. I have several fit Panthers players on my fantasy teams. I want them to do well. I think they will do well, but I believe the Vikings will win this game. All right. Well, that's a close one, and you're going with the Vikings. All right. Arizona Cardinals at New England Patriots. Bias plus score 7.8 favors those Cardinals again. Kyler, are you okay? <laughs> you okay, Kyler? Merry <laughs> Christmas. Cam, are you okay? Cam. <laughs> Cam. Whoa, Cam. We oh. got into that whole conversation about Cam throwing the ball deep. And uh, when we go to comments, I, I actually have some great video of the of the top five deep passes from that weekend. So, okay. uh, and I think you kind of kind of misunderstood where I was kind of leading toward with that when I say his, his pass fell short. Um, I'm, I was actually thinking more about the coaches. I'm thinking, did the coaches think that he was going to drop that into the end zone? You know, they were they seeing something, you know, else and maybe practice or something? Because mm -hmm. I didn't – that was a long – that would have been another 10-plus yards. He would have had to throw that thing a good, like you said, close to 70 yards in the air. If he hadn't been doing that in practice, did they think he was going to do it? Or maybe they should have ran one of those things where you throw it to the one guy and then he, he pitches it back to the other side of the field or something like that if they wasn't well, going to get it all the way down into the end zone. They had a bat down. They only had two choices. Where they were on the field, they only had two choices. That was to dump it off to somebody and try to lateral it around and get a miracle or throw it as far as you can, hope somebody can come down with it, and then maybe pitch it to somebody or break loose and score. Those are the only chances they had. That they there was a guy on uh, the morning show, um, a defensive back, and I, I, his name's escaping me, but he was talking about he was in that situation as a defender where they tell you to bat the ball down. Right. And he went up and he was like, I could have easily caught it. But they emphasized, bat the ball down. And he batted it right to somebody. <laughs> and it got caught and ran it in for a touchdown. It happens. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that happen. Oh, man. But that would have been a play because if you don't, if it's just going to get to the 10-yard line, you got to have a, a second part to that deal there. Or like you said, you just hoping – everybody fall down and he runs it in. So I was really questioning the kind of the call is like that really what you thought, you know, you were going to be, you were going to succeed with. Um, well, if do Cam you think they would have going to put it 70 yards in the air. You think they would have succeeded by throwing something short and trying to pitch it around? I don't know about short. I was more in, in the mode of throwing it deep and having it batted to somebody. I kind of like that idea. Everybody well, that's probably what he tried to do. Maybe it was. I didn't see that, though. You know, I didn't see, like, usually when you have that, you have a receiver who's outside of the pile waiting for the ball to be hit to him. 
kind of letting everybody go beyond him. I didn't see that guy there. So um, I didn't see that, that as a play that had developed oh. in that manner. Okay. Any of that, Cardinals, 7.8, what do you have? Well, let me say this. The Patriots' defense uh, has held opponents under 20 points only three times this season. And outside of a pretty good uh, showing versus the uh, Ravens in week 10, they seem to be regressing to me and regressing pretty badly. Again, a defense that people spoke highly of early in the season is now getting picked apart pretty badly and getting run on even worse. Um, that's not a good thing with Kyler Murray and the Cardinals air raid offense coming to town. Um, I don't really have to say much more about that. I don't, Kyler doesn't even have uh, an injury de designation as far as I know, which means to me that his shoulder is fine. So take the Cardinals. Um, it's going to be a nice show up there in New England, but not for the Patriots. The main place that the Cardinals seem to have that advantage is in their scoring. They're seventh uh, in scoring. Um, New England's coming in at 26 in scoring. Their defense is actually 13th. You said 20 points. They're giving up an average of 23. 0.8 points per game. So uh, the Cardinals have that advantage. Let's let's see if Kyler's, you know, can be consistent in, uh, in that. Okay. Another team that I thought was going to win and didn't, a division uh, game here, but the Dolphins have been playing so well and the Jets have been occupying last place so well that the bias plus, this looks to be the largest of the weekend, 22.1 favoring the Dolphins. Uh, yeah, this, there won't be any surprises in this one. The Dolphins are going to win this game. I'm definitely taking the Dolphins. Uh, Tua Vailoa, I love saying his name now that I can say it, uh, <laughs> struggled mightily against Denver last week, and he was benched in favor of Ryan Fitzpatrick. Now, there have been whispers that because of early success, Perhaps Tua has taken the NFL a little lightly. Kind of <laughs> taking the NFL for granted. Really? Yes. In fact, and I don't know if this is true or not, but supposedly someone quoted him as saying something along the lines of, it's, it's not as difficult as I thought it would be. Or something, I'm paraphrasing. Ben, I actually did hear something like that. Yeah, and like it's not that tough, which is leading people to the speculation that he's not putting in the time, type of time and preparation that he should before these games. So hopefully this will have snapped him out of that because there's nothing worse than starting a game, getting beat up, playing badly, and getting benched. You know, especially when you're supposed to be the Messiah for your, for your organization. Um, it's probably time for him to swallow his pride. He's got to buckle down. He's got to handle his business. He's got to look at his film. He's got to do everything that's necessary to be prepared to play. Good thing though, he's got the Jets. So this is a good get right game for him. <laughs> uh, and you expect that he'll be back in the starting uh, Absolutely, absolutely. At the start of the game, so. Absolutely. All right, going with the Dolphins, the Fins, Browns at Jaguars, an AFC matchup, bias plus score 8.5, favors the Browns. Who you have? Uh, Browns versus Jaguars. Let me find my notes. I messed up my notes here. Well, they're both uh, negative net point teams. Jacksonville coming in 31st with minus 9.6 net points. Cleveland coming in 20th with minus 2.3. So right there you see that differential favors Cleveland. Yeah, um, I just wanted to get my, my notes together. There's no doubt that I'm going to take Cleveland in this one. I really like the Browns, to tell you the truth. And they've got a good record in a really tough division. Uh, if somehow they can pull off an upset or two uh, in a division game, that would do them well. But uh, with this COVID situation and the fact that they're going to let 
two more wild card teams into the playoffs this year because of it, the Browns got a pretty good shot of getting in. So that's good. Um, they handled the Eagles last week, uh, 22-17. It was their third really bad weather game. Wind, pouring down rain, all kind of crazy stuff. Uh, Baker Mayfield has gone scoreless in all three of those games, hasn't thrown a touchdown pass in three games. But they won two of them. How did they do it, you ask? The return. How did they Nick do Chubb. it? <laughs> Nick Chubb, baby. Nick, Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb. He galloped for 126 yards on 19 carries in week 10 and 114 yards on 20 carries in week 11. Enough said. It's raining. It's cold. Give me the ball. That's it. It's over. It and, his, and his running buddy going airborne. Oh, Kareem Hunt. You know, Kareem Hunt statistically didn't have a good game, but that touchdown run was nice. <laughs> that was nice. That's you know how they have on uh, GMFB uh, angry runs? Yeah. That was a hungry run. <laughs> that was a hungry run. He's like, I'm getting in here, and you're not going to stop me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We saw two. I saw two of those type of runs, uh, one from Tampa Bay and the other from the tight end for the Titans, I believe, where they were stopped like almost 10 yards away from the line of scrimmage. No, the Titans game, that was a wide receiver, A.J. Brown. He just A.J. Looked, Brown, he looked like a tight end. He looks like a tight end. <laughs> you know what I want to see? And I don't, don't get me wrong, no homo here, folks, okay? I'd like to see him with his shirt off standing next to D.K. Metcalf. I'm telling you, that boy's a specimen, too. A.J. Brown ain't no joke. You think A.J. D.K. like up under there? I believe so. He might not be as cut up, but he is a big boy, and he can run. Yes, it, it, it was amazing to see. And and again, who was that? Mike Evans um, for, for Tampa Bay. We know he's what six four, six five. You know. Yeah, yeah. He got it. He 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 scored a nice one too. But yeah, yeah. You could I tell. mean, just turned around and just kept going, and guys, you know, tackling to high and trying to grab and hold, and it just wasn't working. You could tell he was extremely um, determined in that game. I think he got wind of all the Jalen Ramsey talk, and he took it really personal. Like, this guy's going to travel back and forth with me across the field wherever I go and all this stuff. Like, he's just going to shut me down, and they're going to have to win without me. He took that real personal. Okay, okay. Well, Jalen will make you take it personally. <laughs> You're going with the Browns. Yes, sir. Going with the Browns here. New Orleans Saints at Denver Broncos. Bias plus score 15.2 favors the Saints with the new look. <laughs> the yeah. Taysom Hill led Saints. So it, this is a game where and let me say something about the Saints again real quick, too. Uh, this is something that I heard. I think I read it on uh, – I think there was some stuff on Twitter, and I saw something on Facebook in regards to some of the reporters listening to and asking questions of some of the veteran players on the Saints. And a lot of them were surprised that they decided to start Taysom Hill. And a lot of them said if it was up to them – they would have started Jameis. Now, I, I don't know what that means. I'm not saying that they're disgruntled or anything. Obviously, Taysom Hill had a good game. They won the game. They believe in their coach. Um, some folks were looking at this like, well, they're playing Atlanta. If we're going to find out what we got in this guy, we have to let him get out there and actually play a full game at the quarterback position. They accomplished that. Now, Moving forward, are they going to continue to start him or are they now going to bring in Jameis? I don't know. Usually Thursday is the day when the head coaches pretty much decide or actually answer the question when it's asked of them who their starting quarterback is going to be. So that remains to be seen. But um, I got a funny feeling he's going to stick with Taysom. Anyway, uh, the Broncos benefited from an out-of-sync Dolphins offense last week. There's no doubt about that. Tua was off. 
He wasn't prepared. Um, they sent the kitchen sink at him. He couldn't handle it. He ends up getting benched. Uh, they won't be that lucky this week. Uh, Taysom Hill was surprisingly impressive last week versus Atlanta. He actually went 18 for 23 for 233 yards. He ran 10 times for 51 yards, and he scored two rushing touchdowns. So that's what they want from a guy like him. Taysom Hill is in the Lamar Jackson Kyler Murray mold. I'm not saying he's equal to them. I'm not saying he's as fast as them, but he's in that mold. He is a mobile quarterback plus. And I'm trying to get away from the whole running quarterback uh, vernacular, if I'm using that word correctly. Um, mobile quarterbacks is what you want. And to be mobile means you can be able to move around in the pocket successfully get out of the pocket and find success and actually run design run plays with success. You can only do that with a mobile quarterback. Why the Eagles are trying to do it with Carson Wentz. I don't know. Oops. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> he had a few decent short passes. Um, but that's their know. game. He, yeah. He, you know, he had a few, he still has um, the top receiver. They can't can't guard, um, can't guard Mike. And Mike had a good game too. And I've been waiting for Mike. So that, long, that that helps, you know. So, but but you kind of don't expect him to be too much, like you said, of a classic drop back and then and then run the ball type guy. So we'll see. But, right, but if he's going to be their quarterback, if he's going to be their quarterback of the future, then he has to have a drop back element to his game. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so, and the only way they're going to find that out, especially again in a season where you had no OTAs, no preseason, none of that, you know what I mean? They want to find out. They thought they saw an opportunity to find out. They took the opportunity. He showed well. Good for him. I'm happy for him. Uh, take the Saints. I don't think the Broncos will have anything to offer them um, offensively. Uh, the Saints defense, again, like I said earlier is really beginning to surge right now, especially their pass rush. Oh, my goodness. Woo. Man, they're smoking, man. They're smoking. Your Saints have the eighth-ranked defense. Uh, Denver's coming in with the 27th-ranked offense. So I think you're spot on with that. All right. My beloved San Francisco 49ers. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> gotta, <laughs> gotta go mess with those Rams. Bias plus score 5.2 favors the Rams. It's funny. You, you're funny, man. Again, you read my mind sometimes. You read my mind sometimes. People oh. have to remember that there's nothing I can do about the numbers. The numbers are what they are. No opinion, no conjecture. My Niners are not favored in this one. <laughs> However, Mostert's coming back. Um, uh, another one of our running backs is coming back, but we still have Nick Mullins at quarterback. So, uh. so the good thing for the Niners is they're coming off a much needed buy. It's giving them extra time to prepare and extra time to pre prepare Nick Mullins at the quarterback spot. They also could possibly get back their two lead running backs, Raheem Mostert and Tevin Coleman. Possibly. Most Tevin? This, Tevin Coleman could possibly be back this week also. Mm. Now, they just took Mostert off of IR officially. But when they take a player off of IR, it leaves them a 21-day window to actually activate him or not. You see what I'm saying? So just the fact that they took him off of IR just simply means that he's allowed to now begin to work out with the team and practice and, and then they and then they take it from there. So they have to see what he looks like in a live practice. He'll probably practice in a limited fashion. Uh, I don't know what he did yesterday, but he probably practiced in a limited fashion today and will probably do so again. I don't know if they're going to practice tomorrow or not as Thanksgiving. But chances are they will be in the facility in the morning, at least for treatment, if nothing else. And then they'll see what he can do on Friday. 
So they're not for sure. Now, if they do come back, or even if one of them comes back, that's a big plus. On top of the fact that you had several receivers that were dealing with COVID issues and injuries, I believe they will all be back except possibly for Debo Samuel. He's got a knee or a hamstring, I can't remember which, that's really hampering him quite a bit. So he's still a little iffy. But other than that, they should be pretty if uh, pretty healthy. Now, the bad news. <laughs> they got to go to L.A. and meet the red, hot, smoking Rams. Let me tell you something, man. They just won real impressively last week and the week before when they beat the Seahawks. So they got back-to-back -back wins over the Seahawks and the Buccaneers. And they were impressive wins. Now, I'll tell you this about the Buccaneers game last week. I believe, oh, what is his name? The head coach for the Rams, Rams name. These names, I'm sorry, I'm getting old, you guys. I forget the name. He outcoached Arians. He straight outcoached him. Goff came in, took the snap, ball gone. Took the snap, ball gone. Took the snap, oh, he's not open, ball gone. Bro. They barely ran the ball. He was firing that secondary up before they knew what hit him. He, he, did, he totally, totally changed their game. The, the Rams, to me, are a more intermediate to downfield type of team, or at least they have been. They have a short game. He, he picked them apart. Picked them apart. It was tremendous. So the Rams are really finding a groove right now. You are in the toughest division, bro, of all divisions, if you ask me. People want to talk about the division with the Ravens and the Steelers. And that NFC West is rough, and everybody is taking off except you guys. If you guys could somehow figure out a way to win this game, it would do you a tremendous amount of good. But I don't see it happening, bro. I really don't. I'm, I'm sorry to say I'm going with the Rams, sticking with the bias on this one. Well, I said last week when I was watching the Rams play Tampa, and I, I said Tampa hasn't seen a team this efficient yet. This is the first time they're seeing a team this efficient. Extremely efficient. Extremely, Extremely efficient. efficient. The Bucs uh -huh. did not look like they were ready for that type of an attack. No, uh-uh, uh-uh. So, you know, it is what it is. Go Niners. Kansas City Chiefs. Speaking of, not ready for that attack, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But the bias plus score is only 4.9 favoring the Chiefs. So it's about, on average, under five points a game. Hmm. Hmm. So I go down my list and I make my notes and I say so-and-so's at so-and-so, so-and-so's playing so-and-so. And I go through and I do my notes and I do my study and then I pick the team that I think is going to win. This is the one game I have a question mark beside. 4.9, we've seen closer, but that's pretty close. Especially for a team or especially for a game where you have a team like the Chiefs who light it up week after week after week and a team like the Bucks that look great one week, look horrible the next week, look okay the next week. It's kind of crazy. Uh, and we're going to have to have a discussion. I don't want to take up a lot of time now about it, but some of those talks that we had about Drew Brees and his arm, we're going to need to start talking about Mr. Brady, but I digress. So I agree. Here's how I look at this. And this is going to be this is going to sound crazy. And I'm when I'm finished talking, I'm going to make my decision who I'm picking. I'm going to talk myself into or out of something. <laughs> the Bucks have four losses this season. They lost Week One to New Orleans by one point. They came back the next week and they handled Carolina. Handled them pretty pretty easily. They lost improbably to Nick Foles and the Bears in Week Five. They came back the next week and cruised past Green Bay like it was nothing. They lost badly to the Saints in their second meeting. They got smashed. That's the game was like 38-3. to 
They came back the next week, played the Panthers again, crushed them. <laughs> the defense has had their issues this season. No doubt about that. And we talked about that earlier. They look great on paper, but sometimes they don't produce. But it may be time to start looking at Tom Brady. Over the last four games, he is 0 for 19 on pass attempts of 20 plus yards. So remember when you said you didn't know why they were going long and it looked like they were going long unnecessarily? Yeah, maybe it was unnecessary. Maybe it was necessary. The thing is, he didn't complete the passes. They were badly thrown balls, they look like to me. So that's an issue. So now, do I sound the red alert on Brady and pick the Chiefs? Or do I go with their pattern of comebacks and big time comebacks against good teams after they've taken a loss? What say you? Well, you know, when I'm looking at it, you've got the uh, number one offense scoring 32 points a game, going up against the number 10 defense. No conjecture, no opinion. Points. I ask you. And I'm adding one and one here. Go ahead. And I'm looking at the number seven defense of Kansas City. Mm -hmm. going up against the number six offense of Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the challenge in Tampa Bay is, uh, the, is coaching. Let me ask you a quick question. Yes. Does Big Ben call his own plays? I heard somebody say that. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I heard somebody that, say that on like the radio or something like that. And I was like, I, I didn't get a chance to, to look it up because they were questioning whether or not Brady's going to uh, make an adjustment in the way they coach or the coach is going to make an adjustment in the way he plays. And uh, again, uh, there's, there is this question about, his, you know, going deep. Yeah. He has not been doing that well. But I, in many cases, I didn't see a lot of times where it wasn't like the guy was wide open. Like at least Mahomes, every once in a while, he'll roll out and the defense will just break down and the guy's standing there by himself. They won the game like that last week. You know, uh, of all people, Kelsey's in the middle of the end zone. Ain't nobody 10 yards close to him. That's not happening necessarily in Tampa Bay. So – you know, he has to be on point with, with those passes if he's going to really execute what Bruce Arian wants. And I think that's where they have the problem, which is, you know, I think the Chiefs are a little more efficient than that. And, you know, so it makes sense to go with the Chiefs in this particular situation. Well, I mean, I mean let's face it, Brady actually doesn't have the physical ability to break the pocket, roll out, break down a defense and then throw the ball. He's just, he's just that, not that guy. So he's never going to be able to do that. Uh, as far as um, so if somebody's going to get wide open, that's going to have to come out of the scheme and him throwing out of the pocket. Right. And I'm not saying that on those deep balls. Right. Right. Exactly. But what they're de dependent on is his pinpoint accuracy. They're dependent on him to throw guys open. Okay. And I've seen him do it two zillion times. But lately, it hasn't been happening. You look at that receiver core. Oh, my God. He's loaded. He's loaded. Yet, they don't quite seem to be, you know, really getting it done. And I don't know. I thought after the Bears game, remember I told you he was mad. He was really angry after that Bears game. That he ran off the field, didn't shake hands or anything and all that. And I said he was probably going to have a sit down with with um with arians and uh byron leftwich and talk about that offense a little bit and try to get them to understand that there are certain things that he does well and certain things that he doesn't feel comfortable with and for them to make the adjustment okay seems very foolish to me for them to try to get him to adjust to things as far as their system is concerned i'm sure he can run most of what their system consists of Okay, but 
the way they the way they're having him run the offense and try to attack defenses I think has elements that he's not comfortable with I, I hope I'm making this you know make myself sound clear here and 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 I think that there may be some lack of communication maybe because Brady wants to show that he can do these kind of things but he's having trouble with it they they might have to work something out they're going to have to work something out I've seen them play games where he looks totally comfortable he's throwing balls where he likes to throw them he's get, he's spreading the ball around to several different receivers he looks wonderful and then they get in situations where and here's another thing that hampered them they couldn't get their run game going when they can't get their run game going Okay, again, this is not the same Tom Brady. Okay, so he may not, even with all those weapons, he may not be able to control a game like he used to when their run game is not there. So, you know. Well, you're absolutely right, especially relative to the run game. The one interception he had, I literally tweeted out that when you got a weak-ass play action, that fool absolutely nobody. Exactly. And you turn, you take, you turn, you've turned your back. I mean, if you're going to do play action, you got to overcome the fact that you're going to turn your back to the defense to some degree, turn around, make your sightings, and get that ball off. The idea is that somebody bit on that play action, and now you got somebody wide open. Nobody bit on the play action. And then, like I said, Leonard Fournette sold him out at least three times, dropping passes in the flat. Um, and, you know, that that really hurt. I mean, you get Leonard Fournette out in the flat and you expect you should be able to get some kind of production out of it. But then he drops the ball. So, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And I, I never really liked Leonard Fournette, to tell you the truth. I never picked him in fantasy. Get that I, feeling. From listening you know, to and, and the knock the knock on him coming out of LSU was that he didn't catch the ball well and he worked on that and he got better. He actually worked on it and got better, and probably has. If we check the note, uh, check the uh, the, the, the uh, stats, probably has more receptions than the other running back Ronald Jones has. But yeah, in that game, no sir, he he really let Brady down. He let the team down. And let me mention, I did not when we talked about New Orleans, Denver. They they kick off the four o'clock group of games. Um, San Francisco. Um, Rams is four o'clock, and Kansas City, Tampa Bay is four twenty-five on the schedule. Don't know that Titans uh, or that Baltimore Ravens Pittsburgh game. Don't know what slot they're going to put that in if it's a one o'clock or four o'clock game. By All right, way, I'm taking the Buccaneers. <laughs> you okay? No, I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> Flabber, F L A B E R G A S T E D, gasted, flabbergasted. You're taking the Bucks for real. I'm taking the Bucks for real. Going against the bias, taking the Bucks after all he just said. Oh my goodness! All right. Sunday night, Chicago at Green Bay, NFC Central matchup. Bias plus score 7.1 favors the Packers. I don't even know who the Bears are going to – is Nick Foles out? Is he hurt? Are we – Trubisky's hurt. Who's who's starting for the Bears? It's worse <laughs> than, the, than, than the Bengals. We have no clue. Is, is Kaepernick coming back? Is he going to start for the Bears? <laughs> what? <laughs> I saw something. I saw something, and it said, if Kaepernick's phone doesn't ring this week, it will never ring. <laughs> That's what it says. And basically, they were saying, if the Bears or the Cincinnati Bengals do not call, especially the Bengals, do not call him, Ain't nobody ever going to call him. Well, <laughs> if I had to put money on it, ain't nobody ever going to call him. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I agree. I agree. Because, believe me, if that call was going to be made, it would have been made Sunday night. So, you know. 
But uh, yeah, the, the Bears are in bad shape. Uh, Foles is still a little jacked up. Trubisky's been jacked up. His shoulder was way worse than even I suspected. I stopped looking for any news about him because I figured, well, they gave Foles the job, that's it. But Trubisky's actually been hurt for most of this time. So it's a little questionable. It's a little up in the air. If he's healthy enough to go, there's a possibility that he could start this game because Foles has looked bad. They've lost their last four games in a row. He's, th- excuse me, he's thrown an interception, at least one interception in almost every single game. In fact, I think there's only been one game that he started that he didn't throw an interception. Mm. So yeah, that's crazy. Go pack, go take to take Green Bay without going with the pack. Bay. Yeah, I didn't. I had no doubt about that one as yeah. far as, as your your concern. All right, Monday night. This team is going to have to travel from the west. Wait a minute, it's a night game, so it don't make a difference, and it's not a one o'clock game, right? That's that, right. That, that's the east. Travel, bias plus score 7.5, favors the Seahawks. And remember, because of the proximity to Seahawks, when they travel to the East Coast, they travel farther than teams that come from L.A. A longer trip, absolutely. A longer trip. But uh, but this game doesn't start till 8.15. Yeah, somehow the Eagles keep getting these primetime games. I don't get it. But anyway, the Eagles' offense is a mess mostly because of bad play calling and, and shoddy quarterback play. And even if they were playing well, to me, it would be crazy to think that they could keep up with the Seahawks and Russell Wilson. So, uh, but besides that, something seems to have clicked with the Seahawks defense. Okay. I'm seeing these defenses all of a sudden, you know, we're getting down to, to, to the mad rush to the end for playoff seeding and stuff. And these teams that have had really good offenses, but their defenses have been holding them back a little bit, they're starting to uh, get themselves together here. So the Seahawks are one of those teams. I believe they will play pretty well on defense. And even if they didn't, there's no way the Eagles could keep up with the Seahawks offense. And even if the Eagles offense was playing well, they still don't have the weapons to keep up with the Seahawks offense. Big day for Metcalf, big day for Lockett, and Chris Carson may be back also. Big day for him too, all in fantasy. If you have them in fantasy, please play them. They will help you win. I'm glad you said that. Last week, we literally said that uh, Chris Carson coming back, the run game is going to really help the Seahawks, but it wasn't Chris Carson running the ball. Last no. week, it was, it was my old Niner yes. <laughs> running back yes. that came in and really did the job. He did really well. But do you have his yardage? Uh, no, no, I don't Carlos have Carlos Hyde looked good. Carlos Hyde, I you know, I always liked Carlos. I didn't, I wanted them to keep him when they traded him. Um, but Carlos really, I thought, was a big difference maker. If I were to name three difference makers, he would be there. The other Carlos, Carlos Dunlap, on the defensive line. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Was especially disruptive. Yes. You know. And And then then Jamal Adams. And then you bring Jamal Adams back in there. Now, all of a sudden, you got a defense again, you know, that's playing a lot better than what their numbers showed. And that's – kind of what I was saying I that, that change you see that uh-oh you know going into the fourth quarter who get who's getting it in gear just right and again you go into the fourth quarter you get into a change in the weather patterns colder rainier snowier more need to run the ball so we we talked about even you know Tom Brady needing a run game um you know, both of these teams need that run game. Seattle has a better shot at it. So you're going with? Seahawks. Seahawks, all right. Well, Benny, um, going with the bias on that, ending up week 11, we have to congratulate 
the Denver Broncos <laughs> as the bias plus busters of the week with an unfavorable bias plus score of 14.5. They won the game by seven points, giving them a 21.5 bias plus score highest of the weekend. So congratulations to the Denver Broncos. This hurts on so many levels. <laughs> no, it does. Remember who got fired as the head coach of the Denver Broncos? Who? Brian Flores. <laughs> right. Tua stinks it up. The defense loses their minds. I don't know what the heck happened to them. And, 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 uh, yeah, that, that was a stinker. That was a stinker. Well, they got it together. They got it done. And, hey, look, everybody gets their little chance in the sunshine, man. So, all right, that wraps up the Bias Plus report for week 12. Last words on the Bias Plus, Benny? Mm, nope. Let's right. wrap the games and see how they go.